Tonight, we're going to open with a little bit of a worship, and then there's going to be a bit of an intro, and Carly's going to lead us into some breakout rooms. With me tonight is Carly Martin. Carly was our summer student this summer who focused on music ministry. Carly is a graduate of Sheridan College um, Musical Theater Program. Carly worked for us for three years in the summer, two years, three years, three years, and um really gave us some great music. If you ever want to go and check it out on the Canadian Shield Regional Council website or YouTube, I really recommend it. And Carly lives in Thunder Bay and is an active theater performer up there as well, which is wonderful. So Carly, I'm so excited to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. It's so great to, to be in a space with you all. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this evening and to connecting further with everyone. Great. Um, so as we come together, we're going to come together and worship. And our first sort of song that I thought we would join in listening together um, comes to us actually from Eleanor Daly, who is the music director at Fair, Fairlawn United Church in Toronto. I don't know how many people saw Eleanor's interview that she did for Broadview Magazine, but Eleanor was recently awarded the Order of Canada. And I love this one section where she, they ask her what she thinks, what about the future of church music? And she says that one of the biggest shifts over the years is the language in hymns. Uh, she finds that some of the newer hymns, there are fewer metaphors and more direct language. And she thinks that it has been with a mix of success. And I just love this part. All I know, she says, is that church music has survived for over hundred hundreds of years, and I don't see it disappearing anytime soon. So I just realized I didn't share it with my sound, so I'm going to stop, share, and reshare. And we're going to listen to one of her songs called Oh, Be Joyful in the Lord. And this was recorded during the pandemic by her church. Thank you. 
So as I shared with some folks as they were coming in, this is for me, uh, my final sort of big piece of my work for both Shining Waters and Canadian Shield as tomorrow I head on to, uh, after tomorrow I head on to six weeks of time off before I joined Port Elgin United Church as their new minister. And I was really thinking a lot about this relationship that has developed between the regional council and music ministry and where we've been able to, on our end, get it right and where we, on our end, are still working <laughs> on getting it right. And something that I thought a lot about, um, especially as I was re-listening to a lot of this music that people created during the last few years, was the ways in which we have been able to build relationships unlike any we ever had before. And so I went all the way back. Uh, let's all sort of take a little journey back and hopefully it doesn't provide some angst for people to July of 2020 when um, I was invited to write a letter to the church musicians of Shining Waters Regional Council at the time. And in that letter, I spent a lot of time really thinking about what we were missing as we were sort of locked away in our own spaces and our own homes. And I really started to think about the amount of work that church musicians had to put in in a whole new way during that time. Some of you may remember having to learn how to record music, or learn all the various different ways in which you could try to get sound across Zoom without people sharing their sound back when you're trying to play. And some people are laughing right now, probably going, oh gosh, I never want to return to that and I don't blame you. But in that time, and I still to this day mean this, that I was so grateful for the willingness that church musicians put in to pivot their ministry and the responsibility of their ministry in the church. As you're going to see throughout the survey, there's an importance for each and every one of us of how our faith is enacted by song and by music and by hymns and by our engagement through worshiping God through that. And so there's a joy that comes, I think, with singing, unlike it comes with other stuff. I know there's a few ministers like myself on here, and I won't say that our sermons don't bring joy or something like that. But in a very different way, music expresses who and what we are as a people of faith. Even in my interview with Port Elgin in June, we started talking about church music. And I said to them that there's a lot that I can tell about a church person or a church community based off the hymns they sing, the hymns they like, the hymns they don't like. Um, you can tell their theology, you can tell the way in which they want to move and who they are expressed based off of those hymns. So music is one of the most important expressions of our faith. And so I reread that email and really thought about how much has changed in music for us. And now as we're coming out of this time of isolation and pandemic, and we still are coming out of this time, and it may be a 10, 15, 20 year process of coming out of this time, um, we're relearning what it is to be musically together. And we're relearning why that loss of that music at that time was so important and so desperately needed to be back again in our lives. And so I remain extremely grateful to every community of faith over these three years that have engaged me with questions about music. Uh, I remain grateful to every single church musician that has desired to engage on a larger scale outside of your community of faith as well, to make connections, to make friends, to learn from one another. Um, because, you know, I, I always go back to him. I think in some ways, William Shakespeare was quite brilliant. And that opening line of Twelfth Night, right, where he says, if music be the food of love, play on. Music is definitely the food of love of the church. And so my only hope is that we can continue to play on. And so with that, I'm going to give you a little different of a song to lead us out of worship. And this song comes to us actually from Trinity and Capriol. 
and it was recorded during the pandemic. It's a little bit more somber, but it was a response to what was happening in the world during that time. And it was a John Bell song, and it's called As If You Were Not There. And so let's listen to that. So that's something that's very different than the first one that we had, but it's nice to sort of be able to look at what was happening across both regions during that time and the skills that we learned and developed over that time. And so now I'm going to pass things off to Carly. Wonderful. Um, those are beautiful pieces and beautiful words also, Jeffrey, thank you for sharing those. Um, one of the questions we asked in the survey um, was to share a moment uh, with music in your church that was significant to you and that was special to you and that you remembered. And we received a lot of really wonderful responses to that that were very heartfelt and heartwarming. Um, and we'd love um, to put you all into breakout rooms so that you might have a moment to share those um, special experiences with um, a few other members of different churches across the region. Um, just as a moment to acknowledge um, different experiences and to also find joy in in music um, from different places. So Jeffrey, I'm, I'm not sure if you are able to facilitate those breakout rooms at all. I have them ready. Um, fabulous. Um, so we will put you into those breakout rooms. We'll give you a, how, how long do we have? Let's say about 10 minutes. It's about two to three participants per room. So you have about five minutes to sort of share your story. Perfect. That's great. And if you have additional time, um, which you may, um, share, share a song that moves you as well and why it does that. 
for you, whether it's the lyrics, the melody, the accompaniment, a person who experienced singing that song. Um, I think those are really great things to discuss. So a significant moment with music and maybe a significant song um, that has moved you in the past or a favorite song. Great. All right. Create, open all rooms. Look at this. I'm getting so much better at this. If you have trouble getting into your room, don't worry. I will make sure I can put you in. Hi, Jillian. Oh, apologies. My internet was acting up, so I'm going to leave you. Okay, no problem. Yeah, you. we are recording at Jillian, so you can watch. We'll make sure that it gets sent out, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, welcome back everyone i hope that was an uh, interesting time to get to know folks and share a bit um if you do want to share anything in the chat uh during the meeting please don't hesitate to do that it would be interesting to hear what music moves folks or what sort of bubbles up for you throughout the night um, we are going to make sure there is lots of time to talk. The next sort of piece now is the presentation of the survey. Um, and then we're going to get more time to sort of have conversations and share thoughts and then a uh, closing worship. But at any time, if you need some clarification or anything as we're sharing the survey, because sometimes I can get super excited and just talk a little bit too quickly or go a little bit too fast, don't hesitate to say, slow down. You can even unmute yourself and yell that at me. I'm quite okay. Um, Carly and I will be going a bit back and forth. Carly will jump in at times as I'm presenting the survey, but don't hesitate. The space is your space as well. So it's great to always have the participation that we desire. So the first thing I'm going to share with you is who participated in the survey. So we actually received 44 survey um, results from Shining Waters and 29 from Canadian Shield. And the participants range from various different churches. There was music directors, MMP members, worship chairs, ministers um, that all responded in some way in the survey. And you're going to see why it's a variety of different people responding based off of some of the results we see. Now, when we get into it, uh, don't look at the math and go, that number doesn't add up to exactly those numbers because not everybody filled everything out. So there's some pieces where the numbers will not equal those two numbers there on your screen. Um, and we wanted to make sure, though, that every number that we did get was included. So that's why we didn't just sort of select the ones that filled everything out as opposed to the ones that didn't. Because I think what we're going to see here is uh, there's some clear cross-section pieces depending on uh, community of faith, the churches. I'm just going to use church for the sake of this conversation. Um, a church's location, uh, a church's resources, a church's sort of experience. So that just gives you a good idea. We were quite impressed with the amount of churches actually that did fill out the survey. Um, it really helped us see because it wasn't just concentrated either. All the, It wasn't just like Shining Waters was not all the churches in Toronto filling it out or all the churches in one area filling out. It was across the entire region, just as it was with Canadian Shield all the way from North Bay to Thunder Bay. So it was nice to be able to have a good cross section across everything. So we're going to begin sort of with what we I would call the preparing for worship piece, the piece that sort of lets us prepare for exactly what it is we're doing in the church from the survey. And this sort of came with who selected hymns in the churches. So right away, the highest number that we saw was a collaboration between music director and minister. That means that in some way there is a conversation between the two that is happening to select the hymns for uh, for a Sunday morning or for a special service. 
The next sort of highest number was the minister selected the hymns. And you're going to see throughout this, there's some reasons why you can tell that the minister selected the hymns. For example, congregations where there isn't a music director in there. Um, what, uh, 17 churches, just the music director alone selected the hymns themselves. And so that was interesting to sort of even consider how that relationship might play out. And what I was seeing in a lot of those instances was there are churches where they don't have a regular minister. They often have a supply minister or even somebody who's filling in for a short period of time, or they might have pulpit supply or something like that. There was three churches where the worship committee themselves select the music. And I would be keenly interested to hear more about that process if anybody was part of those churches, because um, I was keenly interested to figure out how you select music by committee. Um, and then finally, one church, they responded with this, and I felt like we just had to put it in, which is whomever is in charge of worship that Sunday. And I just thought that was a great answer to sort of say somebody's doing worship that Sunday and they're the person that's picking it. So there are some pieces even just within this answer that I was quite heartened by. And that is that the highest number was that collaboration piece. I think that piece can be really integral for a lot of folks in ministry. I know in my experience um, in ministry, I like that collaborative process. And so it's nice to sort of see that that was the highest number. The next piece that we looked at was churches doing pre-recorded or live. And 18 churches responded that they are still using pre-recorded music for a variety of reasons. They don't have a music director. They can't afford a music director. Um, they don't have access to somebody that can play. Uh, well, 36 said that they were using live. There was some in the pre-recorded, I will share, that said that they might use one song that's pre-recorded. So, for example, if the minister really wants this one song to be in with a music video. They might have it up on their screens or something like that. So they use that. But the ones, the majority of the pre-recorded folks were people where there isn't a music director in the church. Now here's where we break down the instruments that we see in the church. So the top uh, musical instrument that is utilized in a majority of the responses was the piano. Next came the organ and next was actually the guitar or then drum slash percussion, um, electrical keyboard, uh, I put trumpet in because some churches had trumpet as the sole instrument that they responded mm. with. I would be very interested to be at a church service where the trumpet was playing the whole time. I don't know what that would look like for some of the hymns, but I thought that was quite interesting. Um, six identified handbells. So this was something that I was kind of shocked by, I'll admit, is that there's somewhere, and it could be even more than six, but there is six handbell choirs or musical experiences in churches across our regions. 15 other instruments were identified at least once themselves, um, and it ranged. Some churches have an accordion that play. One church had an accordion. It's always just one church. One had an accordion. One had a flute, a clarinet. Um, one said ukuleles. So there's this wide breadth of it, but of course, the pieces that we sort of come back to is predominantly we are still seeing the piano, piano and the organ as, um, as instruments that are most utilized in worship services. So in the actual worship service itself... We started with what's the very first thing, and this was quite interesting. 36 churches identified that they use a prelude or a postlude, while six churches identified that they don't have any. Now, what was interesting in this prelude and postlude time was some churches did identify that their prelude could be them teaching a new hymn to the congregation. A few churches identified that their prelude time really is the time that as soon as they start playing, the congregation knows it's time to center themselves for worship. So people sort of start to go silent, go into the worship service and engage in that way. 
And so it was interesting to sort of see the act of the prelude and the postlude for some folks and how that worked. Um, and the churches that identified that they didn't use a prelude or a postlude, I will say from my experience of reading the survey, they were also churches that used pre-recorded music. So they were basically sharing that um, they just didn't have other music for that piece. Next, we go into something that I thought was quite interesting was the number of hymns per worship service. So one identified that they use one or two hymns in their worship service, and that's it. 18 identified that they use three. 31 churches identified that they use four or five hymns per worship service, and nine identified that they use six or more for worship service. It's very interesting when you get to the six or more, and I'm going to share a little bit more as we go through about that piece that I found quite fascinating. But I, what I wasn't sort of shocked by was that the majority of the churches that were utilizing four or five hymns for worship service. Um, and interestingly enough, another piece that I wanted to make sure I highlighted was those folks that were using the recorded music as well often fell into that place. So I found that even more interesting that uh, these churches were finding ways to engage recorded music and at least four or five times throughout their worship service. What this looks like is the number of minutes per worship service that music um, articulates our faith. So in zero to 14 minutes, we're nine communities of faith. 15 to 20 minutes was 34 communities of faith. 21 to 30 minutes was 17. And 31 plus minutes were two. That's interesting. It is interesting. Thank you, whoever just said that, because I found this quite fascinating. So if we look at, for the most part, a majority of our worship services are usually about an hour long. Some people demand that they only be an hour long so they can get to lunch. I don't know if anybody else has ever been in a church like that, but I certainly have where I was told to keep it to an hour. Um, that percentage of our worship service then is one third, half of the worship service, up to half of our worship services are often then um, engaged musically in that hour and hour an hour and a bit and so that became quite interesting for me looking at this because then i started to look at the patterns and we will get into that throughout but this is some a slide that i want you to keep in mind and why i'm going to keep it up for a little bit and keep talking so you can if you want to write it down it then gets interesting when we get into the resources that we allocate towards music in our churches when we know that worship is a vital part of our community and our faith expression, and music has definitely proven itself to be a vital part of our expression of our faith, how much time is allocated within our worship service to that ministry? And how much of that time is dedicated to congregational song as well? To, I have to keep moving everything around. So. so then we got into the hymn books, and this was quite fascinating to me, the hymnals that we use. Don't worry about having to write down all these things right away, too. I don't expect everybody to be able to write down every single hymn book that I have up here. This is being recorded, right? So it will be made available to you afterwards as well if you want to go back and look. But I was very heartened by the folks across both these regions to see that 53 responses were Voices United and 49 responses were more Voices. I think you all deserve a pat on the back uh, for having gotten more Voices somehow into everybody's community of faith lexicon, because I'll be quite blunt to you, this was the spot where I was expecting that to not be as high as it is um just based off of some of the conversations that i've had 
But there was definitely a real concerted effort. And even talking to some colleagues about these results, um, I see Fred is on here, Fred Graham, who was the editor. You were the editor, right, Fred of uh, Voices United? Uh, the co-editor. Co-editor, co-editor. John Ambrose the... is the central editor. Perfect. Thank you so much, Fred. One of the things my one colleague said to me was, we were finding it amazing how much this United Church has embraced Voices United and rallied around it. And so, Fred, thank you so much for all of your hard work to get this into our hands and to give us something that does unite us. If I could just add, uh, yeah. Jeffrey, uh, the esteemed hymnologist uh, Paul Westermeyer has said that that was the finest hymn book of its generation. And now that I'm using common praise as a substitute organist, I have to say that I refer to Voices United all the time. That's great. Thank you, Fred. And, you know, Fred, I, um, I get a lot of new hymn books as they come out from other denominations. And I'm always amazed at the amount of hymns other, other churches are now using that are in our Voices United or in more voices. Um, uh, what's that one called? Community of Christ, uh, who were the yeah. liberal breakoffs from the um, church, Jesus, church of, oh, I'm going to mess that up, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Church. Um, how much of their hymn book is those two? So I was very grateful when that, when my colleague brought that up to me. Some of the other hymnals, and they're worth noting that people use, some people might still know or use songs for a gospel people, that green hymn book that was out there. I remember that as a kid, actually, in the Lutheran church. We thought we were super hip every time we sang, I think, Shine, Jesus, Shine, or something like that from that book. Um, so, uh, One church identified that they used the country and Western, gos Western gospel hymnal. I don't know what that is, but it was very interesting to hear about it. Uh, Songs of the Gospel, which is a red hymn book. I have it somewhere here. Um, Gatheringworship.ca. If you're not on Gathering, we can talk later about that piece. Uh, Celebration Hymnal. Uh, more Songs for Praise and Worship. Uh, Presbyterian Book of Praise. And I know... The person is on who shared that they have a shared ministry with the presbyterian church so that is thanks deborah for waving that is a big piece of it it's blue right deborah yeah okay because i have it here too and i wanted to make sure it was the same book um new hymns for a progressive church now that one was shared with us i found a facebook group that is that so i'm guessing that's where it came from uh, Songs for the Holy Other. If you don't have that already and your church is looking at um, affirmation of LGBT people, that uh, booklet is amazing. I have PDFs of it. Email me tonight when we get off or tomorrow before 5 p.m., maybe even after. I'll check my email at least once in the six weeks to make sure that you can get it because there is some great uh, hymn, uh, hymn tunes that we would all know with uh, new lyrics to it that could help enhance uh, pride service or even other Sunday services um, in there as well. It's a great resource that was published by the Hymn Society. The Hymn Society. What, what did you say that book was called? Songs for the Holy Other. Okay. Uh, the Hymn Society, Ron Klusmeyer, some folks uh, identified that... Um, Oh, yeah. Um, song, uh, some folks identified that they utilize Ron Klusmeyer's resource. Um, I think it's called Music List. Uh, some folks identify Lin Linnea Good. Some churches are still using the Anglican United Church hymn book. Uh, I think one church identified that. And one church identified that they are still using the blue UCC hymnal. So, um, I lots of power to <laughs> for still going into that book too as well. There's um I, I was going through it this past week after I read that and I find it difficult to read it. So anybody that is reading it, um, just how it's set up, uh, I have some respect for you. So then our next piece was about accessibility. So churches identified that the ways in which they are 
being an accessible church to those that need accessibility requirements for um, worship is they've been utilizing projections. I'm finding that there's a lot of folks who really love having the words projected up on a screen now. And I'm hearing from some music directors that they're starting to really love it because they're actually hearing the congregation as they're singing while they're playing because their face isn't down in the hymn book, they're looking up. Many identified that they have large print hymnals and one identified that they have a braille version of Voices United. And they have somebody in their church that needs that. And so they have been utilizing that. If I could step in too, we also um, are putting some of the voices unite or of the uh, more voices. Um, we're printing those in Braille as we use them for the same for for our one member. That's great. Thank you so much. I even know of one church where somebody's in their choir who um, who needs Braille or um, some form of. Uh, finger reading device and they have like a personal device that they hold where it comes up each line sort of appears up on the uh, screen as they go across singing and so there's lots of ways in which we're trying to be an accessible church and lots of ways that we're learning what accessibility looks like for others so thank you Chris for sharing that so this is the part where I had said about the staffing monetary resources for ministry and the reminder of the amount of hymns that we're um, engaging in worship service and the amount of time, because it's going to sort of gel together here. But before I do that, I did see two comments. Sorry, so I'm just gonna check them quick. Oh, I have a few here. I heard that there's another hymn book coming from the United Church out soon. Have you heard that? Yes, they're working on it right now. I've heard from a few folks that they're all still waiting to hear back if their hymns were in. Um, I'm not on that team, but if somebody here is on that team and would like to talk about it, it's called Then Let Us Sing. Um, we'll invite you to share that when we get to that time. Songs for the whole other. Yes, yeah, so although the first, oh, there you go, Deb, thank you. The first release will be digital. The sampler is coming out this week and the full collection in 2025. I'm on the committee working on the collection. There we go, Deb, thank you. I just had to read all the comments. So look for that sampler this week. Uh, Fred has shared that GIA has just published the complete works of Sylvia Dunstan, uh, including some phrases, well worth the investment, and of course, it's Canadian in origin. So thank you for that, Fred. And we can, if people want to know how to get that, I can look that up for you. Um, so don't hesitate still to keep putting your thoughts or um, questions into the chat or just voicing them out loud as I go through here. So when it comes to the resources and staffing pieces, the first was the number of hours a week for, per staffing for music ministry. The highest response we got was that it's volunteers in 16 communities of faith leading music. Then it was one to 10 hours at 13 for paid. 10 to 20 was 13, 10 to 20 hours with 13 respondents. 20 to 30 were six respondents. 30 plus for two respondents. I will share this, and this is me being very honest that we're being recorded, but I guess I'm done tomorrow, so I'll be very honest. Um, there is a disparity that exists, and you will see it, you could see it in the surveys. Those that could afford the higher number of hours were urban churches, um, and were churches that were resource rich. Those that couldn't afford those higher hours were often rural churches. One of the things that I will share reading through the churches where that high number was volunteers was the deep level of commitment that the volunteers have to make sure that music happens in their church and the originality that's happening in those spaces was remarkable for me to be able to read. And in many ways, I will share this as somebody who has been very privileged to always work in a church where there was a music director or a few people leading music. It was very humbling for me to be able to see that deep level of commitment. And I was quite grateful to it too. And so it was that understanding as I was 
going through this survey, recognizing that music happens in our churches in a variety of ways. And that commitment is different depending on the church's context, their locale, and their availability to resources. And so that brings us into the budget for music. 16 churches shared that they spend between $0 and $1,000. And I will share one church even wrote in the survey, we spend as little as possible. And yet they still had some amazing music ministry happening in that church. The next between $1,001 uh, and $5,000 was fine. $5,000 and $10,000 was two. $10,000 and $50,000 was eight. And $50,000 plus was three. And you can imagine again, based off the hours that we saw before, um, where exactly those might fall in line with. Some of these churches, when I did ask them back, had forgotten to put in their music directors salary, so we made sure that we put that in. But this is sort of a clear sort of picture of us seeing exactly where we have monetary resources being spent when it comes to music ministry. It also helps us sort of understand the amount of uh, financial resources that we put into that one third or half of our worship service as well. We wanted to get an idea as, for example, Carly is someone who is often a guest singer at a church. Um, and so we wanted to get an idea of where churches are engaging guests in their singing. And eight churches said that they often have musical guests. I will share that in that number, and we're going to get to how much churches pay for their guests. In that number, there was a great deal of them that said it may be a person's a family member of somebody or something like that that comes in and they're not always paid for it, but they're a musical guest to us because they're not always involved in our music program. Six said once a month, 12 said once a season, and 17 said never or very rarely do they have a musical guest. So then we tried to figure out exactly what the special musical guest payment was, because as we know, there is uh, in the United Church, we know what pulpit supplies um, costs are, but that's not something that is labeled out in the United Church's polity of what we pay musical guests. Um, and four said it's somewhere between zero and 100. 14 said that they pay between 101 and 200. Um, a majority of those 14, they paid about $150. And one was $200 to $300. And the, when I say $200 to $300, that one was $300. I just sort of gave it a little bit of a uh, buffer there, I guess. And that was a church that um, uh, often utilizes a great deal of praise music. Um, and so their guests often come in when they, they were sharing, when they need like a cello for a specific song or something like that. So in our further considerations of this conversation, the first piece that really sort of came out in that was the licensing. There was a lot of churches that asked questions about licensing within the survey as well. There was a few that used one license in CCLI. Um, there were churches that wondered if they even needed licensing when they're not broadcasting online. And so I've been trying to answer those questions. Licensing, I'm sure, again, all of you, this has been such a learning curve over these last three years. I'm still learning about licensing. Every day I feel like a new thing comes up that I get another question and I go, I don't know. Um, but over this time of the pandemic too, we've also discovered songs that aren't covered underneath that, right? And trying to get a hold of a musician. I have had so many emails where I feel awful after finally finding somebody to contact and the family member has to tell me that person has passed on 
or um, they've lost contact with that person or something. And so this is a piece, I just wanted to put this in there because I think it's going to continue to be an evolving piece for us as we try to figure this all out. Luckily, with then Let Us Sing, I'm hoping Deb will actually maybe be willing to share with us. I think um, I, I think they have figured that piece out for all of them. Let us sing. Have you, Deb? Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, the, no, <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, as best as I understand it, because the collection is digital, um, the copyright for anything that is included in that collect collection has been handled so churches are free to use it. That's great. Thank you so much. And thank you for all your hard work on making that happen. It's been real interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. So I just wanted to put this one in because there was still a lot of questions on the survey around licensing, and it's still something that I think is going to keep coming up, especially as we sort of navigate this new space of broadcasting. I had a church ask me um, recently where they could get the licensing for Climb Every Mountain from The Sound of Music, and... <laughs> I, I then had to go and look at the Rogers and Hammerstein organization, which I found out recently their family sold to a big conglomerate. So I was a little disappointed to hear that. But anyway, um, but there's still always going to be those questions, I think, especially as we have different special music that we use in our worship. And finally was the piece that people asked about what the regional council can do to help. Oh, there was a chat here. Oh, I included the title. Thank you, friend. Um, so some churches said that they would love a forum where they could sell or trade choral music on. There were several churches that said they have used some anthems so much that they're ready for something new or different. Um, and they're looking for some type of forum to share their music or get some new music on. Another was the considering for gatherings hosted from across the region, specifically focused on music, where people that are interested in uh, congregational song, choir, uh, music in general could come and participate. Um, another really highlighted the need for intentional engagement at the regional council meetings around music. So if there's a workshop time, there needs to be a workshop around music specifically and bringing people together. Um, I know that there's been some people that are a little bit frustrated right now with um, the Canadian Shield Regional Council date is the same day as the music uh, matters, which we're going to get, get into what that is. And so really ensuring that the Regional Council understands the, pro the priority that many churches, I would say most churches, have on music and <laughs> its need to be highlighted at such meetings for engagement. Um, wider regional... Um, wider regional choir gatherings. Some people said that one of the things that they really enjoyed with their music was when they all got together with the United Churches in their area or other denominations for an Easter sunrise service or a Monday Thursday service. And then they had these large choirs together. Was there a way to facilitate something around that? Digital music resource, that was something that was brought up. So this is a little bit different than, the, than Let Us Sing, but people were saying that they use CDs or um, those MP3 CDs of voices, or more voices for their um, church services and they're limited to just whatever CDs they happen to have. Um, was there something that the regional council could have where they had all of the songs sort of there for people to use? Um, new choral music. One church identified specifically they were looking for music around social justice and how they might be introduced to new choral music. It came up a few times again that there is looking for support for use of tech in worship. I have admitted to every time I try to answer questions on tech with music, I'm a Luddite. I still save everything to my desktop of my computer. Um, but that there is people out there who are experts in this and how do we get them engaged when a church has a question. Next was highlighting the need for to engage with Music United, which 
is a national organization of music directors across um, the United Church of Canada. They come together uh, at the Music Matters Conference once a year. The next one is in May 2024 up in Thunder Bay. So if you're looking to gather with folks, they even talked about, is there any way that the regional council could offer scholarships to people to entice them to go up to there um, and to participate in it? This past one happened to be at Islington United. So I went for one evening because it's four subway stops away from me. So I had no excuse. And it was just great to see people from across the country together talking about music and sharing. And I spoke to some folks that were there afterwards and they said like there was, it was so great for them to just be around other people and to be able to laugh, have joy, commiserate a bit, but also just be in community with people who have the same passion that they're doing. Another was asking the ways in which they could engage young people in music ministry. Um, some churches were identifying that that's how they get their special music is the grandchildren of somebody will come and um, they will play or something like that. But are there other ways to engage them? There was some conversation in the comments about theology and music and the songs that we sing and what that's saying to folks. Um, and that sort of long time conversation of which is not more important, but which are more people leaning towards the beautiful melody that they hear or the words that they're singing and are they paying attention to both or one or the other? And so that was interesting to sort of even consider that conversation. Another just asked for a list of soloists or musicians that they could contact similar to the way in which the regional councils have supply lists. They were looking for supply music lists. So with that, that was a lot of information in that, right? that was just thrusted upon you. Um, we want to make sure that you have a few moments to process it and even just sort of talk in small groups about it. So we're going to give you some time, about 10 minutes now, in some more breakout rooms before we come back to a large group conversation, just so you can say, did I hear that correctly? What did you hear? This is something that shocked me. This didn't shock me. Just stuff like that. Um, and then come back with everything. Be ready to put in the chat. Be ready to share out loud. Um, sort of what, what you're feeling from hearing this. Before we do that, though, does anybody have any questions or just like immediate, you must say something right now? Yeah, Fred. Uh, for those who don't know, I am the convener for the RCCO committee called Professional Support. And I see the ads for you know, almost 100% of the openings for music leadership in all denominations uh, from coast to coast to coast. And the letter that I write hundreds of times is, you have not assessed the hours correctly. It takes five hours to keep your keyboard flexibility. It takes two to three hours for choir practice. It takes a half an hour a week consultation with the clergy. And administration takes another hour or two. I know that some churches don't have the budget to support any, um, any stipend, and I honor that. But for those who write to me and say there are two choirs, a Sunday service, and uh, seasonal concerts, and that can be done in eight hours a week. I just spout through the top of my head. And so I want you to know that I am here for guidance or an ear if you are in this situation. And I wish I could visit every seminary and, and speak to the candidates for ministry to say, this is what the real working life looks like because um, you need to talk to the practitioner before you write an ad at any time. Thanks for the opportunity to vent, bye. <laughs> well, Fred, as a recent seminary graduate, I was grateful for my class in music, but I do wish you could have visited us as well. Um, Fred, could you go through that list again? I, I was trying to write it down as you said it. So we're gonna get him to put it, we'll get him to put it in the chat, okay, Nancy? Yes, okay. Because I just wanna make sure that we can keep moving. Lynn, and then we'll go into breakout rooms. 
Thanks. So I was interested in, um, you know, the, the, the hours of, or the percentage of the service that was devoted to music. And I was wondering, do you think people included a prelude and postlude if they had that in those hours? Or do you think it was really kind of the, just the, the service per se? Because adding those would make a big difference. I'm going to say it was because of the way we asked the question. Thank you for asking that one. I'm going to say it was merely hymns and choir. And if they didn't have a choir, then it was just hymns, just based off the question, the way we asked the question. Okay, so I'm not sure, you might be in the same group as folks uh, you were with before, but I'm going to start that. Pause the this is you come back in. You both have great art on your walls behind you, Lynn. I love your painting. Gail, I love that mask. <laughs> Paintings by one of our congregation members, actually. Is it? Um, who, um, and she, 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 she does trips and paints. And this was from Newfoundland. So it's a Newfoundland style. Um, so it's Puss in Boots, basically. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I have a cat, so. <laughs> That's the thing I do on these meetings usually is look at what, art people have on their walls. <laughs> I just admitted so that on a recording. I'm not gonna lie. I don't like it when people blur their behind them because then I can't see their arm. <laughs> um, I just figure out where they are. Make sure now that everyone's back. Uh, Fred did share in there about church musicians need a minimum of five hours for rehearsal, two to three hours for Sunday two to three hours of choir plus a minute clergy time. These are the stats based on the RCCO. Um, okay, so we're gonna spend about, probably about the next 15 minutes doing this. We'll be about five minutes um, later than what we expected. So I do understand if anybody does have to go right at 8.30, uh, but Carly's gonna lead us through a closing at the end. But is there anything anybody would like to share that came up for you? You can well, raise your Lynn, hand or just wave. Oh, yeah, sorry, again. Lynn and I were just wondering if you were going to send out a an email with the link to the recording of this uh, of this session. We yes. thought it would be useful for those other others in our congregations to listen to it. Yeah, so that is part of my final tasks for tomorrow. Okay. Before I leave at five o'clock tomorrow, I'm going to make sure that there's an email drafted for them to send out. Lovely. Anyone else? Was anyone shocked by what they saw? Actually, I was pleasantly shocked. Oh, and okay. I was pleasantly shocked and I really appreciate that um, the reaching out across our province to um, with our small amounts of um, budgeting towards music and music so important as it is a third to a half that we're looking at ways to um, fill that void by, you know, sp spreading things, whether we can share our music or our licensing or whatever we can do. I think this is great. I think it's very positive and um, I really appreciate the meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Faye. In uh, one of the groups that I was in, people were speaking about um, amalgamations that would involve a church that had been adventurous in its uh, hymn, uh, hymn use and uh, another church that perhaps had been, you know, sticking to a, a little bit smaller repertoire. And, you know, the, the joy and challenge of, you know, trying to expand the collective uh, repertoire of a congregation, but I think that's what fits into maybe bold discipleship that we're called to do, that sort of thing. Like you can't just um, sit and say, well, well, we'll choose what's comfortable all the time. Uh, we are being called to something more. The other thing I just wanted to mention for everybody here, and I am so anxious to get that sampler, Deb. Um, actually, there are a couple of us that are planning to do a um, I sing through the sampler in October. So I've been checking every day to see if it's there. 
Um, that, and that will be, yeah, coming up. Anyhow, um, the United Church of Christ is looking at that to uh, then let us sing. And they're having uh, some sort of a webinar later in September, looking at all of the work that's gone on behind it. The, uh, the local background and the ethical considerations. So I think that really speaks to the quality that we have in our hymn books from Voices United Through More Voices. And now then let us sing that um, this very large uh, church in the States is looking with uh, eager eyes, I think, at our anthology, at our new hymn resource. Mm -hmm. I will share, I remember when I went to a Dolly Parton concert once, she said to everybody there, they kept yelling for her to sing nine to five and I will always love you, like almost right away as soon as she started in the concert. And I was like, calm down, she's definitely gonna sing those. But she told them to stop yelling for those songs. And she said, we'll get to them, but I wanna sing some of my new stuff because at one time all those songs were new songs too, and now they're well loved. So maybe these new ones will be just as loved if you give them a chance. And uh -huh. I always thought that was like the greatest way to say it. And then also probably, she probably sold a few CDs based off that too. But um, I just thought that was a wonderful way to say it, right? Uh, Deb, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to comment a little bit more on Then Let Us Sing. Um, for people who have concerns, especially if you're you're looking far afield to get the right hymn for the right moment, um, that in the Then Let Us Sing collection, any of the new material has been and is being vetted so carefully and with um, some pretty, um, pretty well thought out criteria that support um, the, the primary theologies of the United Church of Canada and things that are of high priority uh, to the United mm -hmm. Church. So uh, focuses on social justice, on uh, affirming relationships, on right relations with Indigenous peoples and uh, that kind of thing. So uh, some of the music is, um, you know, it, I, I can't categorize it because there's there's going to be a good variety of music. So uh, from traditional hymn style music to very contemporary that will play better with a band than it would on the organ, you know. So um, we're, we're excited about it. I mean, the work is still ongoing, but uh, the sampler, yeah, we're all waiting anxiously for it to drop, but it's supposed to be any time now, so... <laughs> That's great. I, I do see Fred shared here um, to ponder. I have given up on the word prelude. I call it music for gathering because I believe, firmly believe that worship is underway once the congregation and musician are met together. It's great. Thank you, Fred, for sharing that. Murray or Barb, I'm not sure. Are you Murray? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yes, um, I, I wanted to comment about one license. Uh, for over six months, I've been doing all the reporting to one license on behalf of Harmony United Church in Thunder Bay. And uh, they have, uh, apart from uh, uh, the uh, public domain, which is a lot of what's in Voices United, one license does cover most of what I've tried to report, but there have been a bunch of exceptions. Every couple of weeks or so, I encounter an exception. Now, uh, in some cases, they're retired United Church ministers or music ministers. And one of them that, because I, 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 I make efforts to get a hold of the uh, copyright holder, and one of them told me that one license didn't want to include him because he only had one hymn that's in, uh, I, I think it's more voices, but anyway, he only had the one hymn and they didn't want to bother with him. So when one license did a survey um, a couple of months ago, I, I, I said that was disconcerting and it shouldn't be like that. Um, so anyway, it's to do it thoroughly, to do the reporting thoroughly takes a lot of time. And I want to do it. I'm motivated to do it because it's really important that 
the composers and authors get compensated. But um, yeah, it's quite um, quite a commitment. It really is. And thank you for sharing that. So I hadn't heard that story yet of somebody having that sort of rejection from one license. So I'm glad that that is on here for us. Um, because that's something that I hadn't heard yet. And I've, I've talked to folks who are, are music directors or worship chairs or ministers that have spent like two to three hours a week just doing the reporting after a service during this time and and coming up really i guess the word is dry with where to go to next when it's not on there so thank you for being committed to that because it is important and it does there's nothing worse we have as far as i know we have yet to experience this where a community of faith during this time has been um copyright uh with a musician had some issues but that's not to say that that can never happen and so doing that work is diligent because i have heard of other community of faith stories for other things where they have had to pay ten twenty thousand dollars for using something that was copyrighted um and so it, it is important just to make sure that your church is protected right like we would want to protect our building with building insurance we have to think about our music ministry in that same way, right? We want to protect our music ministry. So thank you. Joy, I see your hand is up. I just I just wanted to uh, comment that uh, I appreciated Fred's comment about the prelude and also the fact of thanking him for Voices United. I've worked with many, many hymn books as choir leader and uh, organist and right from the blue book, which can be a struggle in this day and age. That's what I started with in the Green Book and Songs for Gospel People and other supplements that came in. But Voices United, right from the index, is so usable. Uh, there are wonderful things. I'm still finding hymns in there that, uh, although we've had the hymn book a number of years, we've not used, and they're just wonderful. And then more voices added to that, and I'm looking forward to the, the newest thing coming out. We are so fortunate. We have dedicated people that keep the music up to date. Music keeps changing and we need to go with the flow. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Fred, I don't know if you knew when you came on this meeting, it'd be a little bit of this is your life type of TV show, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> mm. um, anyone else? God is good. <laughs> All right. Well, I am available tomorrow um, if there is any other questions that come up. But I do, I have, I will share with you and I have no qualms about sharing this. I have stressed to my superiors at uh, Canadian Shield and Shining Waters how important this has been building this relationship as the faith formation minister with uh, music ministry across the regional council and how important it has been for music ministry folk to be able to say that there was somebody that they could go and have that conversation with that didn't exist before. Um, and so I have stressed that my desired hope, I don't make any decisions beyond my own personhood, um, but my desired hope that that would continue with somebody else in this position as they move forward with a new person, because um, if anything, the survey just proved how vital music is to our worshiping life, to our church life, um, to uh, to our theology, to our expression of our faith. And so I'm quite grateful that all of you were willing to take this time tonight to sit and go through the survey and to listen um, and all the work that you're doing within your communities as well to bring music to people who there are certain hymns that will make a person weep because of what it reminds them of. There are certain hymns that will make that one person that you think is never excited to be in church jump out of their seat to sing. Um, music does things that nothing else on this earth can do for us. And so thank you. So I'm going to pass it all off to Carly, who was like the architect of all of this. Carly was the 
sole architect. The only reason why Carly didn't really talk during the survey was because I didn't get my button gear enough today <laughs> to make sure that we had a script so we could go back and forth between the two of us. But Carly oh. was the true architect of all of this. No, no, I want to say um, when when Jeffrey asked me to collaborate on this project, I was so excited because I I grew up loving music. I love music. I'll forever love music. Um, I had singing lessons when I was nine years old. Um, so I've been singing basically as long as I can remember. Um, and so this has been a passion project and I've enjoyed it immensely. And it's been um, exciting to receive all your responses and in their varied capacities. I know not everyone answered all the questions um, and there were different answers for different things but I think one thing really remains true um, out of all of it and Jeffrey said it numerous times but that music is just so important um, so important in our lives and in our faith um, and in our communities and how it is able to bring us together in challenging times and hopeful times and just uplift us um, together in joy and so I really I really thank you for um for sharing um, your thoughts with us and sharing your experiences with us. Um, it has been so valuable um, to have a, a glimpse in to your world and your relationships with music within your church. And I thank you also all um, for your contributions. Um, that goes without saying, but thank you for all you do in your church, not just for filling up the survey. Um, that's just just little little tiny piece of it um thank you for uh, bringing music to life within your church and being a part of that um i know it's appreciated by your congregations but it's appreciated um by us and we're we're thanking you today as well and i also just on the the train of of um thank yous and i i want to also wish jeffrey well on their next adventure because i know it's going to be very exciting um so I hope you'll join me in a round of applause or words of congratulations in the chat um, to wish Jeffrey well on um, their next adventure. It's going to be wonderful. And this new church is so lucky to have them. So um, I want to say that. Um, and I know we're, we're, we're running after time, um, but I, we've talked a lot about resilience um, in our communities and the resilience of music. Um, and I think this all continues moving forward, that we continue to be resilient um, as a community. And I'd love to share just, just a little song with you to close things off so you know that um, I'm, I'm leaving you with some, some words of, um, of hope. And this song I'm gonna share is from one of my favorite musicals. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not a hymn, um, but it is from, from a musical and a song that means a lot to me. It's called Before It's Over. Um, and in the, in the chorus of the song, it talks about um, seeing this world. Um, it's beautiful and strange, um, but we're going to meet it where it is, and we're going to continue forward um, um, together. And so I'm going to share this video with you. If I can share my screen, and if not, then never mind. <laughs> you your but, um, so you should be able to. Okay, wonderful. So I'll share this with you now. Um, and I hope it inspires you moving forward um, to continue your wonderful work. Um, because it is so wonderful. Okay, let's see what happens here. I'm not very good with technology, everyone, even though I was online in Zoom school for um, a year and a bit. <laughs> Let me know if you can see it when it comes up. I don't know if I'm sharing audio or not. It's fine. Um, can we hear it? An awkward girl with her guitar Keeping to herself Friday nights alone With the records on her shelf A waitress Orange and ginger ale and coke. Someone you asked out as a joke. I 
been that girl who fades away, accepting what I've got, stuck in what I am, and everything I'm not. I've only seen this tiny world I'm in, where I can only be what I Thanks, everyone. I hope that inspires you. I find those words very inspiring. Um, I don't know if Jeffrey has anything final so, to add. Thank you all so much. And look for the recording and blessings on the journey ahead. <laughs>